<clears throat> Welcome and aloha. Thanks for joining us at Think Tech Hawaii. And for those of you who are willing to and support Think Tech, this is fundraising time. Think Tech lives on its donations. It's truly appreciated. Anything that you're willing to put in, go to Think Tech Hawaii website, click the donate button and help us out. And today we have with us, uh, returning for the first time since September, a uh, retired Hawaii judge Sandra Sims and author, uh, working on her second book, uh, Back from Vegas <laughs> and other points that uh, may or may not be disclosed in the course. Uh, <laughs> Tina Patterson in Germantown, Maryland, mediator, arbitrator, business coach, consultant, and master of many trades, and also co-chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolutions, Women in Dispute Resolution Committee, which is one of our more active and more productive committees out there. They presented resolutions, directories, and other things to really move the needle in diversity, in dispute resolution, and in law which have both tended to lag behind a lot of the rest of the country and the professions, unfortunately. And Ben Davis, former chair of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution, and now professor, visiting professor at Washington and Lee School of Law and Professor Emeritus from the University of Toledo School of Law. Welcome all of you. Well, we're almost all the way through midterm, still waiting for a few, a few House results, but basically the uh, majorities and most of the positions have been determined. So, hey Ben, where does that leave us? Where are we headed? Or do we even, can we even guess? Well, um, I, I, I... I had a couple of thoughts. One was um, much of the uh, reporting on the election has been about the quote unquote absence of a red wave um, and what happened to the red wave and where's the red tsunami, et cetera. Even a lot of the little cartoons are all framed in that way. But the thing that bothered me is that that framing focuses on the red. My thing is that this was a blue wave, um, a very blue wave across America. Just think of all the deniers who did not get in. You saw some flips of sure. state, uh, both state houses in Michigan. You saw all five of the uh, ballot initiatives on um, uh, abortion. Uh, they passed in Michigan. They passed in California. They passed in uh, um I can't remember the third state. Even uh, Kentucky. Even oh, Kentucky, yeah. Ver, yeah Kentucky. Ver, well, Vermont. Vermont was the third one in terms of uh, pro-choice. And then Kentucky and Montana, they voted down the efforts at anti-choice. Uh, and so, you know, that's five for five. Uh, um, and so, I, you know, that idea, at least to me, of let us change the conversation and think in terms of we are living a blue wave which I think is gonna continue. And the second part of it is that there was a term used over the past few months since Dobbs of this was Rovember. And Rovember was the term for this time. And I'm convinced that Rovember is what happened, what you saw, Ronami happen across mm -hmm. this country. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that energy uh, from people losing their rights and saying, this is not, the way it's going to be. Gonna See, that's the way I would frame it. There's some talk about, you know, people worried about democracy. And I respect that because, you know, when Pelosi's husband was hit, I could see how people would say, this is getting political violence crazy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the chaos, we can't have. But the, mm -hmm. I thought the two things that really struck me the most were a, we had a blue wave or a Ronami. Um, that happened, and that's the way we should think about it going into the Georgia runoff uh, and on uh, for this next couple years. And I just have to tell a joke, which is that 
somebody put up something that said that a runoff is not a parenting a parenting approach for for Herschel Walker. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. Okay. Ooh, I was snap. I said, "Ouch! Ouch!" <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, there you go. Ronami and Blue Wave. That's me. <laughs> Sandra, what's your take? I agree with him on 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 pretty much all of that. But I saw something else, or at least I sensed something else, and that is the power of young people. Because I don't think there was any way to, at least in terms of how the media and pundits approached it, it didn't seem to be a way for them to even determine or to measure what that was going to look like. I mean, we knew the young people were out there, but I don't think it was any, they didn't quite know how to how to gauge what's going on in their heads, except by maybe you'll see, you know, a march or protest. And there were plenty of those. Part of it's too, because, you know, we're in a new, um, you know, I, I'm I'm old school and stuff. And so I still have a, a phone here, but, you know, they don't have a lot of young fo folks don't have these uh, home phone numbers and landlines and stuff, which is where a lot of posters really start to call. And then even if they get your cell number and try to call you there, you know, they're from the generation that I know my kids, they don't answer the phone if they don't know who it is. Uh, so you're not going to get that and you're not going to get the responses in the traditional way that we think of determining polls. That That's gone. That's gone by way of, you know, all the other media and forms that are out there. I think back to the protests we had here in, in Honolulu following George Floyd's death. And George Floyd's murder, I should say. And there was a huge rally here in Honolulu, over 10, you know, 10,000 young people for Black Lives Matter. And, you know, Black people are not a, a small portion of the population here in Honolulu. And that and that protest was organized by teenagers. And they did it via their media, the, you know, the Instagram and the TikTok and the, all the other stuff. That's how they organized it and all the different high schools and stuff. And they came together. And those, I was just, and I thought to myself, my goodness gracious, we've got a whole uh, uh, generation out here that we don't even, I mean, not that we're not counting them in, but we can't read them like we can so-called read, you know, what Latinos are going to do, what Blacks are going to do, what women are going to do. We can't read them. And I like that. I like that. And they're asserting that leader, they're asserting that leadership, they're asserting their positions. And this is the generation that, you know, doesn't take any crap. Yeah, and a couple, a couple of the points that you raised, and you raised many that are really worth digging into and considering more, and we've only got half hour to work with, so we'll do Sorry. what we can. But <laughs> one is that's the generation for whom reproductive choice is a present right in their life, in their face reality. Exactly. Looking at choices and consequences in a very immediate, very personal way. Exactly. And the second thing is that's also the generation that as you really accurately identified, is the most subjected to the social media barrage as their news source as their opinion source. And you've combined those two things, which have been in conflict since at least 2016, where the social media has been pushing exactly what Ben talked about, the red wave, not just for the 2022 campaign, but for most of the last six years, if not all. Mm -hmm. And now you've got an entire generation that's basically saying, not with my life, you don't. Exactly. Exactly. So, Tina, what strikes you about what might have been somewhat unexpected or different or may tell us something about what happened in the midterms? Thank you, Chuck. I think a couple of things. Um, I agree with the... Uh, the media attention regarding the lack of the red wave. And what I saw was that there, as far as social media, is that there is a growing distaste for using social media to weaponize. Um, and we're seeing it more so with young people. Yes, it's a, it, 
it's a media outlet, it's a way to get information. But if it starts to be information that is going to be harmful or basically attempts to hurt someone, we're starting to see more pushback. And it, I think the younger people are taking the lead, but others as well are saying, you know, can you stop with the false narrative and, and putting forward mm-hmm. these stories? Um, mm-hmm. It's thinking about Speaker Pelosi's husband. There was a conversation. Um, the governor of Virginia decided to make a comment. Uh, regarding what happened to Speaker Pelosi's husband. And it was very, I'll I'll say it was very unkind. People not only spoke out, but they they were consistent. And we're seeing this where you you can't make comments that literally step away from civility. It's okay to have a different perspective, but when your comments are harmful or hurtful, um, voters are reminding these elected officials that's not acceptable. That's not the narrative we want to carry forward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're also seeing people looking at the bigger picture. Yes, we're talking re- about reproductive rights, but what else does this impact? Does this impact who I who I choose to marry, who I love? Yes. Um, yes. And it, that it too. is it is generating some concern, some fear, some call to action, although it's not been branded as such. So I'm seeing more of that where people are saying, you know, um, Roe versus Wade and the overturning is just the tip of the iceberg. And we don't stop this now. This is going to become a runaway train. And we're certainly going to be talking about where do we live? Who can we live with? Um, And as I indicated earlier, who do we love? But I have been very pleased with this pushback on, you know, that narrative that you're putting Uh It's not appropriate, you know, yeah. wishing that mm-hmm. somebody be sent back home because their their spouse has been harmed. That's not appropriate conversation. It's not. It's not. As a leader, the expectation is higher. Um, and I, I'm glad to hear our, our young people saying it, but I'm glad to see a, more of a ground swelling from voters overall that are just saying, that's just not acceptable. You know, don't bring that forward. No, and those are great insights. Yeah. So who, one of them raises a question. Do you think people connected what happened to Paul Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's husband, to the January 6th violence? Was it the logical outcome, the next step in the January? Was that what the January 6th people were really intending to do if they got in there and got control? Well, (laughs) if I could jump in on that, you know, the guy, when he got into the house, was yelling, where's Nancy? And that's an immediate uh, resonance with what was going on on January 6th, inescapable exactly. for anybody, you know? And exactly. and I think that, you know, that, that political violence aspect of that was brought very, very abruptly back to people um, um, that mm-hmm. you can't, you know, you, you can't ignore what, what you saw with your own eyes and what the chaos... And the people mm-hmm. behind the chaos want to have happen, I think, is okay. Um, it m- reminded me, in a way, of uh, the governor's race in Arizona, where Katie Hobbs did not debate Carrie Lake the whole time. And I remember pundits saying that she was looking weak and all that. And she just came out with a little message where she said, well, you know, people know who I am. People know who she is. They just got to decide they're going to be adults, you know? And I was like, That's right. she was really smart. You know, she's like, I don't have to debate her. I, you know, you, I'm, I'm serious. I'm an adult and she's who she is, you know, and, and it, it worked for her. You know, I just yeah. thought that was really insightful by her as a candidate, you know, mm-hmm. um, you want chaos. You want to, to, to actually run a country for everybody, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think you're absolutely right, Ben. And I was thinking of the same thing as like when you're tying the what occurred in January 6th, even though there were these efforts to minimize it and make it like, oh, that nothing happened. But by that investigative panel bringing out so many of the details and the horrid, sickening, disgusting details of what was taking place and what was done, you know, to the to the to the officers, how frightened and how 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 they have the effect of. I mean, they were trying to kill Pence. I mean, good Lord. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the effect that it had on the, the representatives who were in, you know, who, they were trapped. They were literally trapped. And I don't think 
it wasn't until we we got a real strong sense. I mean, some of us thought that, but we got a real strong sense of what was occurring when the panel started talking about those things. And then when you see that, it's hard for people to just sit back. Oh, no, no, that was nothing. Oh, Leo, that was not a nothing. I mean, this affected people in, in, in deep people died. And then when the Pelosi, when her husband was attacked, and we come back to that, I think you're right, Ben. It's like people were just uh, starting to say, wait a minute, this, this, we've gone too far. We've gone too far. This is not what we're about. There are issues that need to be determined in this country. We can't just sit here and argue about the election in 2020. There's stuff going on. There are things that we need to take care of. There's a world in crises, and we're arguing about who did the, was the election in 2020 still and of course it was not um so and i and i and i think with those that had those single issues i think the, like carrie lake is a really good example of that because there was at least to my knowledge i don't know that she addressed any real issue other than what happened in the past or what she thinks her interpretation of what happened in the past people are not concerned they want to prepare for What's happening now? We got to take care of our communities, our children, our schools, our, you know, our world. We got bigger fish to fry than you guys' grievances. I mean, that wasn't that was another piece that I got from at least maybe that's just my own personal thing, but I feel really strongly about that. And I'm sure there, I mean, I know people that feel the same. That come on now, we got stuff to do here. We don't have time for this foolishness. And then when you get terribly mean spirited about it and you're turning to violence, it's like, you know. I'm out of here. <laughs> I just I'm not doing this, <laughs> you know. No, and but, those are really great points to bring out and bring up and understand. Hey, and they raise the question: Did what happened in the lead up to and the midterms and the aftermath of the midterms? It, did those, at least to some extent, effectively discredit? the replacement theory, the uh, that whole set of Republican talking points that Trump and McCarthy and others, Bobert, Green, Gates, have been living off of for the last few years. I think it has. What's I think left it's of those? Em- yeah, Tina. I'll just say this quickly because it's not a specific answer to your question. I think it has, and I think it's going to impact the conversation regarding who becomes the next speaker of the House. Kevin yeah. McCarthy is not favored. Um, he he is he's got to run just like everyone else, and it's partially because of these theories that he's been putting forward, where the Republicans are saying, "Do we really want this narrative to come from our speaker?" Um, not necessarily, you know, um, yes, Nancy could, you know, representing the minority group, but Kevin, not so much. And and I think we're seeing this where the, the distaste for carrying that narrative forward, people mm-hmm. are distancing themselves. Some Republicans are saying, hold up, let's not talk about 2024. That's too far away. Right now, we need to stay. We've got stuff there. to we do. Don't. we got stuff to do. <laughs> Well, I yeah. noticed today, you know, uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi stepped down and said she's not going to run for for speaker, which and then she even mentioned about passing the torch to a different a generation, which like and following what you say, Tina, it's going to just change the conversation because it, much of their uh, capital has been spent on Republicans capital has been spent on demonizing uh, Nancy Pelosi. So. You know, you don't have that to do. You got to, if you put someone else up there, and I think she's she's an extremely brilliant woman. Lord have mercy. I just, but she's like basically saying, you're not going to kick me around. I'm going to put someone else up here who's going to be talking about what we're going to do for the country. And you guys go after that person and see what you're going to do. And I think that's really what she's done is kind of thrown, thrown that gauntlet down. It's like, okay, do you want to do, do something for the country or you just want to, you know, play games with me? And strategically, that may be, and and then we'll go straight to you, Ben, but Mm -hmm. strategically, that may be a brilliant move because it moves the the focus. Yeah, for 16 years, she's been the leader of the Democratic Party in the House, including majority. And it's put the focus on the leadership and the direction of the choices 
mm-hmm. and on mm-hmm. shifting the leadership, changing the leadership to people that are more in tune with and aligned with the real issues, the real values that voters have brought into play in the yeah. term elections. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, I I, I agree 100% with, with, with what's been said. And, you know, I, I'm kind of reminded of those big waves you have off Hawaii where you see those surfers and those blue waves. <laughs> and I just feel like a whole lot of cold water got blown on a lot of Republicans right now. Oh, yeah. Cold oh, yeah. blue water got blown on them. The problem that they have is you know they didn't have a platform in 2000 as far as i've seen they don't have a platform they don't on anything today except the classic republican one which is you know reduce taxes right that's all they got and they got and on all these issues whether it's climate change or infrastructure or you know these fundamental rights issues i mean the only thing i saw some of these candidates on the republican side do was kind of delete things from their website that they'd been saying before when they started to feel that row heat. But you didn't hear, you know, <laughs> that's, that's all I saw. I didn't that see is. anybody saying, you know, and, and you know, uh, stepping out of line. And the other thing is that, you know, I think it's Clyburn said that uh, uh, politics, uh, the blood of politics is money, right? And if they have, if their donors are the same ones that have been before who are telling them this story that they need to to say, I don't see how they get out of that box of being how they've been. And how they've been has been kind of like a little bit of chaos or a lot of chaos. A lot of chaos. <laughs> Not a lot of chaos. Just, just and, they, I, and they fomented chaos everywhere. They, you know, they've just yeah. fomented chaos. Um, and I'm just not sure. Yeah. You know? And yeah. what, if you, what if you flip that perspective on its head, Ben, instead of saying these Republican talking points are what the donors wanted to see them sell in advance. What if it were the Republicans going to the donors saying, we can sell in advance these talking points. They're going to serve your interest. And now they haven't. And- no, no. I was reading somewhere today where some of the well, following uh, Trump's announcement that he's going to run against some of the major donors for that were part of his campaign before, but they're, they're not doing it. It's time to move on. So he's not going to, you know, I mean, he may be out there and it may end up, it may very well be that that's all the Republicans will be able to put up because he's just going to be in the way of everything. And and yeah. they just can't, they can't shake themselves of him. That's Unless he goes a to jail, really important point. You know, between Trump and DeSantis, do you see either one of those two letting go, giving up, deferring to the other? No. Nope. So Unless one of them Young, goes to jail. <laughs> right. So you got Youngkin who's trying to come in, you know, and you got uh, Asa Hutchinson down in Arkansas come in. But, you know, the comment that I just make about, if you look across that group, right, is like, what are they going to do what they for do? the country. I mean, they, you know, they, one of them will be do divisive and the other one will be, we're going to bring people together, right? That's going to be the two games. But I'm talking about the policy underneath. The only policy they have underneath is cut taxes. That's an old story. And, you know, cut Medicare, cut Medicaid, cut Social Security, all that, which is what Scott was running the, his Republican committee just on. Like- you know, <laughs> you know, I mean... That's that's back to nineteen sixties uh, kind of a Republican policy, you know, and it, that's not not for a modern world. And oh yeah, well let's the uh, what are we going to uh, not support Ukraine, you know, and and all that stuff, you know. I mean, I'm like, that's not serious. It's not yeah. serious. Even yeah. if you're a nice guy, it's still not serious, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's like what you got. So yeah. what's it, what's it going to take for Kevin McCarthy? To- to get 218 votes, not only to become Speaker of the House, but to get any legislation by. I don't know, because they're, because we don't know what they stand for. I'm, I'm like with Ben, we don't know what they stand for anything other than the than the tax cut. So if someone comes forth with something, they don't even, there doesn't seem to be like a, a, 
any sort of a, a issue or policy, like Ben has said, that they're they've become known for and they're wanting to vouch for that you're going to get a majority of people in the country to vote for. I mean, it's great to do these Republican primaries because you can, yeah, you can do that. But are you going to appeal to a, to a national electorate? And he didn't do it in 2020. He's certainly not going to do it in 2024. Well, and Ben's point's a really important one. If, yeah. the, if the Republicans with the media and history and so many things on their side <clears throat> came out of the midterms the way they have, losing the Senate and getting such a narrow majority in the House that their own factions may prevent them from being able to do anything. Exactly. Exactly. What's going to happen in 2024? Where are we headed? Well, maybe I'm an optimist, okay? But uh, my, my view is that... Uh, the American people, at least this time around, showed that they weren't going to get played. And I think that American people have got an attitude, which is they're not going to get themselves played. They, you know, the, the old fool me once, shame on me, but uh, fool me twice, <laughs> exactly. you know, or fame, shame on you, shame on me. I got it all right. I did, just did the oh, George yeah. Bush, whatever. But, uh, but, you know, <laughs> but you know, we, get, we get the point. We get the point. You know, but, you know, you know what I mean? It's just. I, I, you know, I, I may be wrong. I mean, it's different places and different things, but, uh, I, you know, I, you, you got, I, I mean, I'm just I'm not going to do red state, blue state here, but I'm going to do more sort of along the lines of how is it that you can live in a state and be the, one of the poorest states in the United States and you can vote against things that would help you to be better by voting for people who will keep you poor. I mean, that's a question to every American I see in every state that's down in the last 10 or so states on the lists on everything, whether it's child mortality, literacy, education, poverty, whatever. It's like, how many times do you have to be in this spot until you say, you know, there's something wrong with this? where I'm voting for you, and then you're saying I need to blame this person over here for my problem. It, it you know, it, it, I don't know how long that has to go on, but yeah, it just seems to me it's gone on a long time for a lot of people who are hurting badly, you know. And Okay, in our, last, in our last minute, Sandra, any idea where we're headed? I'm, I'm, I'm with Ben. I'm an optimist, and I have I, you know, I have tremendous faith in our young people and their ability to 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 make remake this country and address the issues because they're they're having there's so much of what you know there's the, there's so many so much of the rights that we sort of generation fought for that they've had to see those things being at at stake of being lost is motivation for them. I think I, you look at the gun rights you know, the gun rights issue. The young people are the ones that are most affected by that, by this avalanche of, you know, gun violence in their schools. I think for, for most of us, the notion of having to do, uh, you know, drills for, for, for shooters never occurred to us going to school. But this is a part of their world. And it's just not, it's, it doesn't make sense because it's not necessary. And I think they're seeing this, like, this is not the way, I mean, I'm not, against people having guns. I'm not, that's not my position, but I think there's certain things, you know, people just shouldn't be walking around with assault rifles. It's just not necessary. And for them to be so directly impacted by these, these things is, is something for them to kind of fight for. And I, and I think that's what you're seeing. And so Tina, to finish us off, let me phrase it a little differently. What do you think are the markers that may tell us where we're headed? in the next few years? Uh, markers. Um, people, are, people are literally organizing. They're, they're coming together and they're not using the tools that Nielsen ratings and other pollsters yes. have used. Yes, 
know, they're being innovative, they're being creative, they're taking different approaches and saying, you know what, I'm going to text you, this is where you need to be, or let's, let's get together and have a circle. And we're, so in some ways, it's innovative, in other ways, it's, it's the approaches that we saw our grandparents take, we saw our elders take when they didn't have technology. Um, and I think that's the marker that we're seeing where people are saying enough is enough. Between the events of January 6th, the increase in school shootings, um, and people, for the most part, never thought that Roe versus Wade would be overturned. And the reality is it's happening. So now what? And, and now means we need, to, we need to take a different course of action. What worked in the past, it isn't working. So, the, you know, if, if the older folks can't do it, the younger folks will. They're going to do it. Exactly. <laughs> Well, that's a great note to leave things on. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank Tech Hawaii. Support us if you're willing. And happy Thanksgiving, all. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.